So welcome, Elle McCarthy. I'm really thrilled to be um, here with you talking on our Studio TEDx series today. Um, for everyone who's joining us and doesn't know who Elle is, can't be many of you, she's currently VP uh, of Brand and Social Impact at Electronic Arts. Uh, and Electronic Arts are a global leader in digital interactive entertainment with much loved gaming brands such as EA Sports, FIFA, F1 and The Sims under their belt. Uh, Elle hails originally from the UK, we share that in common, although now based in California and started her career as a strategist in highly acclaimed creative agencies such as Karmarama, BBH and BBDO before moving client side for new, new adventures and experiences. In Elle's current role, uh, she focuses on three things that she cares cash passionately about, increasing brand value, enabling uh, talent advocacy, and increasing social impact efforts, uh, which means that spans everything from corporate philanthropy, impact reporting and volunteering initiatives, as well as attracting more diverse talent into the industry. So all wonderful things there. Elle essentially has her hands on all the levers that drive brand reputation uh, and meaning, both from an internal and an external point of view in a very real way, which is a great companion to the personal work uh, that she has under her belt, advocating for change, speaking out on seemingly taboo subjects, which I've always enjoyed listening to, and championing women in the broadest sense in underrepresented spaces. So thank you so much for joining us today. Really um, excited to be here with you and uh, having the ability to have a chat. So I'm gonna dive right in, first question. So I'd love to start by asking what your mindset is around the role of business culture in brand building and how you engage and empower employees in this process, which I know is something that you care about very deeply. One of my catchphrases, which is not an, a personal catchphrase, it's just something that I, I don't even know where I've adopted it from, but great brands are built from the inside out is something that I like to say a lot. And by that, I mean a few things. One um, is that you can't build a great external brand if the employees don't believe that what you're saying is true. Um, I really think that employees are and should be the primary advocates for your brand because they have to wake up every morning and go to work and be intrinsically motivated by working for the company. And bringing those two things into alignment um, is a passion area of mine. Um, it was it was a really incredible challenge to come to Electronic Arts, a brand that is 40 years old and was founded on this incredible founding manifesto. A lot of people know um, the line, we see further, which can be read as a, um, I guess, a proposition around innovation. Um, but actually it spoke to a belief that perpetuated the internal culture of the company when it was founded. And that belief was that video games are good for you because they wake up your brain and they are an active form of entertainment. I loved what you said in the intro about EA being in the entertainment space and having a lot of beloved gaming franchises rather than being in the gaming space, because I think that's another way of expressing um, the, the buzzword of 2021, which was metaverses, which um, is quite controversial and also often really meaningless. Um, and if you want to know more about that, always look at uh, James Watley's work, at Diva Agency. He really breaks down the difference between metaversal experiences versus the metaverse and, and helps to debunk that that doesn't actually exist. Um, but for us in the gaming industry, almost everybody is thinking about how the future of entertainment is interactive. And that was the founding premise of EA 40 years ago. Um, and so part of that, in the manifesto, what they said was that they believed that developers were the great artists of the next era because they were going to construct these new forms of interactive entertainment that would therefore be good for you and wake up your brain and all of that good stuff. Um, but over time, the company became the product of a series of mergers and acquisitions. And in the world of gaming, you've got these really interesting tensions between um, where the creative power of a company lies and anything that is deemed to be centralized because once you acquire a studio one of the most important things is that that studio can maintain its creative culture um, and that the talent can be really empowered to continue building the games the way that they always built the game because usually a studio is acquired on the premise that a game is incredible and that a set of 
talented developers are going to be making more games of that ilk or able to innovate to break through in a similar way. Um, so coming into EA, video game publisher, as part of a central team, understanding that we were built on this incredible future facing premise that actually the opportunity to live is now and understanding that anything representing a central brand proposition is going to have to work really well and really hard in these creative epicenters um, and you know where 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 the product lives um, that was this really interesting tension because there was already a tension between employees on the gaming side employees and central teams in the industry as a whole and so um what we started to do was to implement a brand purpose and brand purpose well brand building gets eye rolls brand purpose gets even more eye rolls mm -hmm. um but we knew that our purpose had to be um authentic therefore to the work that was happening today and adaptable by any employee so that they can see how that plays out in the work that they're doing um, and what I didn't realize would happen was that we'd start doing these big interviews and understanding from all of the employees, the more senior employees, but also um, employees in areas of the business that, um, that don't usually have their voices heard. Um, and at the same time, we were engaging to start helping drive some um, cross franchise positioning into how we were going to solve toxicity and harassment issues in the industry. And those two things ended up converging. So the purpose of the company today is that EA exists to expand the positive power of play. And positive play now is a team because that purpose led to us supporting on the business case to bring in a team to drive that cross franchise feature roadmap that would help us to meet that goal and that ambition. Positive play is also that purpose, but it sits, um, there are three pillars of strategic work that sit underneath it. So expand the positive power of play is about driving greater representation into our games and into our company. And so our DEI goals are mirroring in that first pillar, uh, the representation goals that are um, created by the positive play team. And then positive play is established as play that um, drives creativity and connection. And so really living actually the original purpose of the company, but working on things that can help put that into our players' hands um, as increasingly uh, all game makers are focused on how players can participate in their games to be part of the creator economy. We just saw um, at the GDC Epic making some really incredible gains in that world. It's the premise that Roblox was built on. Um, and so it's an area that we have to compete in, but it has to be true and come from us as a company and how we're going to deliver it. Um, and then there's the power of play, and that's the more aspirational element. But when you put it all together, it's OK, I think, to have a bit of aspiration as long as you're grounding your overall proposition in truth for the truth today. The aspiration, though, is really exciting, which is that play can be a force to actually help solve real world problems because game development theory and game design could actually help us to solve sustainability issues. And there's some things that we do today at a product level um, that can do that. So I'll give a really basic example, which is that The Sims has released eco packs. And so if you use an eco pack in The Sims, you actually learn about how to be more environmentally friendly. Uh, but we could also be engaging with much bigger organizations and using the types of brain and the types of thinking within our organization to solve real world problems. Um, and to do the same thing, actually, to bring more people into STEAM careers and into our, our walls. So that's sort of where we've landed. We built it based on where the product was at today, what was already happening in the company, how we could consolidate it and give it more of a North Star. Um, and we did so much internal work before we even started telling any stories about that externally. And I think that's partly what's really important. Yes, that's um, that's such a great um, tour de force through how you get to uh, a place where you've got an idea driving everything that has enough space in it to accommodate all the things that you, you want to connect and feel are important in the business in terms of uh, where people in the business are at and the kind of initiatives that are important in terms of developing them in the future while staying very rooted in where you've come from in the past. I think that's always the ideal state, isn't it? You want It has to be, as you say, rooted in a 
something that feels very real and truthful for the organization that you're that you're in but still feel like it's contemporary in terms of the people who for who, who the organization is not in the hands of at that space in time you know it has to be relevant and modern and, and connect with them as well I want to ask a follow-on question connected to that which is around um, how you amplify the voices of people inside the organization and some of the more um, so we live in a world now which is very different to when I started working where you kind of just had to toe the line about everything didn't you and we didn't have the digital sphere where you could share everything and have lots of exchanges with lots of different types of people and you also didn't have the pressure to present yourself in a particular way in that regard and so everything was a, quite a bit more linear coming down the track and controllable from a company perspective which is just not the case now is it so uh, that means that you can have these kind of tensions and conflicts and differing points of views within an organization from the people in it. And yet you've still got to figure out like what represents the organization, the people in it, the different perspectives. It's quite a tricky kind of managing and juggling act, isn't it? So t tell me a little bit, because I know you're a big advocate of Amplify the Voices. So what happens when you're trying to do that and you're also trying to manage lots of different uh, kind of viewpoints, as it were? Yeah, I think we're we're at this really interesting inflection point post 2020, where um, everybody is so fixated on employee advocacy, employee activism, um, and so many brands this year, last year, are making statements to say we are not an activist brand. But if you go back to 2020, people weren't making statements we are an activist brand, but they were making more activist statements. Um, Erica Ciro, I hope I'm saying her surname correctly, she's the chief marketing officer of Bain. And I was at a conference where she was presenting really interesting data the other day. Um, and it just encapsulates this challenge. And she says that in 2020, I think it was ap approximately 90% of CEOs said that they thought that companies should be taking a more proactive stance on social justice. And in 2022, approximately 90% of CEOs thought that companies should be taking a less proactive stance on social justice. And so you've got this incredible flip and, you know, we, we see this with politics, we, we see this with how binary things have become, things swing in one direction, then there's a big backlash, they swing in another direction. And it actually shows us how reactive we've been as businesses. Um, you know, I think we can all look back to 2020 and the murder of George Floyd and pinpoint that as a, a moment in time where companies and brands almost all unanimously decided to take a stand on Black Lives Matter. And some did better than others because, and essentially that was premised on how proactive they had been in the past, uh, whether they had been funding activist groups or not, how good their diversity, equity statistics already were. Um, and, but also a lot of companies got away in that moment with putting a donation out and making a statement and being part of a, a cultural moment. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd like to say everybody in the world agrees that racism is bad and that police brutality is bad. And the truth is that's not strictly true, but there is more consensus on something like um, Black Lives Matter and George Floyd and what happened and the fact that it was wrong than there has been recently in the context of Roe v. Wade. Um, and partly, I think, you know, when you've seen a lot of businesses choose to not make statements in that area, um, it's often because of maybe where their investments, where their investors lie, maybe it's to do with the board director. You know, we, we can speculate why companies chose to not make statements about that. Um, but I think those two moments really represent this fascinating pendulum swing. And I think the truth is businesses, um, businesses may, may not be activists and most businesses aren't and shouldn't be employees increasingly aren't defining themselves as activists when they are asking their businesses to either take a stand behind something or to help support them. Um, and so a lot of this comes down to managing expectations, managing expectations about what the value of making a company statement is and what the company is already doing and what the company already stands behind. 
Um, in, in the case of Roe versus Wade, you know, we were very clear that our focus um, at EA was on providing the appropriate healthcare benefits to our employees um, and having a nuanced conversation about the fact that this isn't just a moment in time that's affecting women and women's rights, but it's also affecting um, anybody who isn't cis and their rights in the US because this is you know, the first piece of legislation and that we've seen many other pieces of in legislation introduced to um, attack the rights of the LGBTQ plus community and the trans community. Um, and we're predicting that that's just going to continue over time. Yes, that's great. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Elle. I've really enjoyed our conversation. I feel like I could talk for another couple of hours together, actually. And I, I'm really intrigued. I'm going to ask you this little question before we sign off. So you mentioned the stat about the CEOs and how they've gone from, was it 90% or 95% who were talking in activist language and then the reverse happening a few years? Have you got a, have you got a view on why that might be? Um, Yes, I, I think that um, a lot of CEOs, you know, we know what the demographic makeup of most CEOs are. You know, I'll, I'll tell you the last two CEOs I've worked for have been white men called Andrew. Oh. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, <laughs> great allies. Yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed working with both of them. Um, but we know what the demographic makeup of, of CEOs are. And this is a broad observation. It's not to do with my Andrews. Uh, broadly, I think that a lot of male CEOs have had an awakening to this being important and it felt important and urgent and also a little bit mystified. And as they, you know, most people did a lot of self-education in the moment of 2020, because that's what, it, that's what everyone was calling for. Having understood more, I think they understood that it's a rabbit hole. And, you know, if you're if you're me and you've dedicated your whole career to DEI, I know that I don't show up perfect often and that I need to give myself the grace to to know that I don't show up perfect in the knowledge that I have to make pursuit of learning in this space lifelong, credit my references and um, always apologize and always be humble and always you know admit fault for causing harm because I, I have white privilege and other forms of privilege too and having understood how complicated things are maybe the commitment to lifelong learning actually isn't quite there and then there's also culturally the fact that these issues do become more and more nuanced and you know we see a lot of infighting on the left um and in the liberal sides, because we're trying to push each other to be better. Um, but it means that, you know, the issues aren't just binary, they're so nuanced. And, um, you know, what I hear a lot is, well, we can't please everyone. But because we can't please everyone, I don't think that should mean we do nothing. Um, but I, you know, I do think that we need to be clear about what we can stand behind and the commitments that we can make. I think that there's maybe um, a sense that we can't make indefinite commitments we can't commit to indefinite learning and so therefore it's better to just focus on driving shareholder value because it's a comfort zone for a lot of the people who are currently in charge that's interesting well I, I, you and I are both optimists we share that and I'd like to think um, that give it a couple of years we will have gone through that inevitable bell curve of people talking an awful lot about this stuff into doing and that there's a sort of hiatus period in the time where in between where everyone's trying to get their heads around exactly how you make that translation and of course you'll lose some people along the way who perhaps weren't as committed as they could have been but what you gain on the other side through people who are will actually be the kind of momentum that we need to to change things especially with younger with our younger generations coming up who just seem to have, have this integrated into them in such a happy way that it will happen more naturally yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I think it's inevitable, you know, just like we inevitably are going to need to service diverse audiences because the audience is diverse. <laughs> um, I would love to have the same level of optimism around the inevitability that um, people in the C-suite and on boards, crucially, because that's the area that's really lagging, will also be diverse. I don't think it's inevitable. I think we're going to have to work really hard and fight for it. Um, I hope that I will both be a CEO one day and on boards and help to drive that representation, open the door for others. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Listen, thank you, um, Elle, thank you again. And I can't wait to talk again soon.